Uh, and yeah, so this is my talk. Uh, you, some of you may recognise the title of the talk from elsewhere. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the relevance of one of the chapters of Darcy Thompson's book uh, to neuroscience or neuroimaging. So a few of you might have seen images like this. So pictures of brains with blobs that are orange, usually. So I'm one of the lucky people that gets to decide what color these blobs are. <laughs> um, and when we, when we make these maps of blobs from fMRI data, we usually work with data from many, many different subjects. And different people have different sized brains, they have different folding, they have um, different shaped brains. So in order to make these maps, which are like an average of many people, we need to warp the brains together. Um, we can't warp things exactly, but we can do reasonably okay. There's a certain amount of randomness in the folding of uh, the human brain surface. Uh, some of it explained you know, relatively recently by a, a, a paper that looked at the uh, kind of physical rules for or tried to figure out the physical rules of, of folding. And they made some models and they found they got similarish folding patterns. So that, that, that is the kind of thing that Darcy would have appreciated, I think. Um, so we've got to be able to warp brains. So these are just 2D images. In reality, we work with 3D images. So it's like many slices of MRI images stuck together to make a 3D volume and we, we, we kind of deform these 3D volumes uh, to, to, to align them together. And at the end of the alignment, we hope to get some kind of an average. We, we, we hope to be able to create some kind of an average of many people's brains that is kind of representative of, of what an average brain is like. Um, but the things we're interested in are not just the ability to warp different people's brains together. It's also kind of interesting to, to look at the warps themselves because these warps encode information about the relative shapes of different individuals' brains or the relative volumes of different parts of an individual's brains. So I'll just see if I can show this movie again. Uh, so this is a subject with dementia, uh, so scanned several times, and you can see parts of the brain uh, expand. Well, this isn't really part of the brain. This is a hole. This is uh, the ventricle. These are ventricles. So that's you know the, the bags of fluid in the middle of the brain getting bigger, and the back of the brain kind of shrinking. And from the warps, we can we can actually compute what's getting bigger or smaller. So where it's white, that's where things are getting bigger. And where it's dark, that's where things are shrinking. So this, this, this is quite a bad example. You know, I, I would not want to be that patient. That patient's probably not around anymore. <laughs> um, but we can, we can look at you know, what, what happens on average. So these are kind of elderly subjects. Uh, and these are subjects with dementia, and we can kind of average these maps from the different uh, populations, and we can see a kind of characteristic pattern that we usually see in Alzheimer's disease. So the ventricles, these fluid-filled bits in the middle of the brain, they get bigger over time. And around the hippocampus and parts of uh, the brain called the temporal lobe, they kind of shrink. Uh, and the, the hippocampus is involved in navigation. So, uh, you know, taxi drivers, for example, they tend to have uh, different hippocampi to uh, bus drivers, uh, which is why people with dementia often kind of get lost. So, this is looking at the geometry. Um, we can also make predictions about individuals. So, these are based on, I think it was about five, I can't remember now, 550 or 580 brains of different subjects are doing some kind of cross-validation, trying to guess the ages of people based on their brain images. Uh, so these are the actual ages, these are the predicted ages. Uh, and you can get quite good predictions. 
Uh, okay, maybe it's not that interesting, you know, if you just ask, ask someone how old they are. But <laughs> if it was, you know, if it was my brain and it predicted that I was 80, I would not be happy. Um, but we can, we can, you know, try and make predictions about other things based on, based on the anatomy using, using the deformation information. So Hester told me that, she, you know, she wanted something about groups. So here's a little bit about groups. So Darcy mentioned uh, that groups were important. So this is an example of a, of a transformation which is based on a group um, that involves rigid rotation and isotropic zooming. And you know what, what it means with these groups is that you know if you if you well, maybe I'll explain it a, a simpler case. If you do a rigid rotation of something and then you do another rigid rotation. You can keep rigidly rotating, and what you end up with is something rigidly rotated. Uh, and it's the same with this. So if you do an isotropic zoom and a, a rigid rotation in 2D, uh, and you keep repeating that, what you end up with is, is a transformation that's a rigid rotation and a isotropic scaling in 2D. Um, and you know the whole. You, you heard a bit about exponentials earlier. So you know some of the mathematics behind this involves a different form of exponential. So it's using matrix exponentials to, to encode stuff. But this is just kind of rigid -y stuff. It's not so interesting. What we want is something nonlinear. Uh, so this is an example of a nonlinear deformation. Again, it involves a kind of group. So if we warp something in a way that preserves a one-to-one -one mapping, and then we combine that with another one-to-one -one mapping, we end up with a one-to-one -one mapping. So it's a kind of group. Um, and the way that it is sometimes done in practice is using a set of equations called the euler poincare differential equations. Uh, uh, so that's, that's a name that was invented by um, a guy called Daryl Home at Imperial College, who is organizing um, some workshops on growth and form and self-organization, which will be at the Newton Institute in Cambridge um, um, later this year. For those of you who are going to be in the Cambridge area who like the maths. Um, so yeah, that was the EP diff equation, and I'll just show that again because it took a while to make that animation. So, so anyway, it's deforming, uh, and it's deforming in a kind of nonlinear way. So if we get the, if we see the dots, we see these dots aren't moving in a straight line. They're they're, they're following a curved trajectory, uh, and then at one point, at some point, it kind of flips direction, and then converges back again. So these, these warps are encoded by you know, a, a configuration space and some, and some velocities, and then you just kind of shoot, and it ends up with a nonlinear warp. Anyway, that's enough of the maths. <laughs> um, so yeah, I usually warp brains, but after a while, I, I get bored looking at brains. Um, so I've been messing about with some faces. And for me, it's easy to develop things in 2D. If I can warp things in 2D, I can see what's going on, and things run a lot faster. So I've been playing with faces. Uh, and one thing I've been doing is kind of combining warps and appearance models. So take a large data set of faces. Uh, so use about 900 faces. Many of them were the, of the same individuals, but in, with different facial expressions. And did a kind of principal component analysis type thing. So the idea was to be able to represent biological data using a, a small number of components. So each of these rows is, is one of the components. So there's a gradual transition from there to there. So that's the first component, second component, third component. And there'll be 40 of these, uh, which will be used to encode you know, facial variability in this case. So that's the kind of thing uh, it produces. So we have. That's the original data. That's the fit to the data. Uh, so part of it is a, is, is a shape thing, and part of it is an appearance thing. So the idea of, is that this appearance thing, it shouldn't appear to move so much. It should just look different. You know, bits get darker or lighter. Uh, whereas the geometric information is encoded by that bit. Uh, but it's also possible to do it with other things. Uh, so again, that's a kind of shape model, and that's a sort of appearance model. And the idea is to kind of 
fit the, the real data to the, the simulated data. So this is just testing things out. Uh, because these digits, these are a kind of standard machine learning uh, test set uh, called MNIST. Uh, so the idea was to compare this approach to you know, neural networks. Um, so in terms of being able to kind of guess which digit you know, we're looking at, it's about where neural networks were about 10 years ago if you give it a large training set. If you give it a small training set, it does better than, your, than, than, than you know, the best deep learning algorithms. And I'll end with my second favorite mug from home. Uh, this mug is available for purchase uh, at the uh, museum in Dundee. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, John, <laughs> for sharing inside and also the animation I really liked. Um, any questions about this? Silence. Or any reactions? Or um, I'm looking to our playing musician. Oh. It's not necessary, yeah. <laughs> question over there. Because <laughs> sometimes it's helpful to have some music and then suddenly pops up a question, but I see one here. Hold on. <laughs> yes, uh, I have a question. Um, thank you for, for the nice uh, pictures also. Um, I have a question. Are you actually doing numeric uh, modulation or are you actually doing um, mathematical modulation? It seems to be that you just try to fix known uh, features to a, to a numeric uh, modulation. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of, yeah, it's data modeling. It's, uh, it's optimizing, uh, fitting, fitting a model, you know, like a, 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 a 2D or 3D model to, to data. Um, yeah. OK. Thank you for questioning, and um, I really have to be strict, but because of time, we do questions very short. <laughs> um, but we're getting now to the time where uh, we can all have a, a, a little break, a pause, 15 minutes. You either can get something to drink outside, or you can use your time, look to the exposition over here, go to a speaker, ask other questions, and I'll see you back in uh, 15 minutes. Okay. And an extra applause, please, for John Masker. <laughs> <laughs>